Okay, so we're back here at one o'clock Eastern and we're into one of our concurrent sessions. So this session is titled Transitioning Organically, Exploring Alternative Site Preparation Methods. And we have a special speaker here, Sarah Nisi from the Xerces Society. Hopefully I said your name right. <laughs> Um, so Sarah is originally from central Iowa and is a graduate from Drake University with a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science. Her experience includes natural resource management in the private and public sector, native seed propagation, and private land management throughout the state of Iowa. Currently, Sarah covers all of Iowa, providing technical and financial assistance to farmers and landowners interested in pollinator conservation, as well as training natural resource conservation service and RCS staff and partner staff on pollinators, native vegetation, native seed and seed mixes, and native plant identification. In her free time, she enjoys recreating outdoors and volunteering for a number of local NGO conservation groups. So welcome, Sarah. Thank you. And if you want to go ahead and share your screen. How are things looking? I can see it. Perfect. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. I really appreciate it. And it's pretty exciting to have my first um, international outreach event. And today we're going to be talking about transitioning organically, exploring alternative site preparation methods. And um, I'll start off by saying that uh, at Xerces, by and large, we're working with farmers um, for the most part. So much of our organic site prep uh, experience comes from working on farms and within that landscape. But certainly there are ways that you can apply some of these techniques, ideas and methods into other spaces um, outside of the farm. But I just kind of wanted to start off with that caveat before we begin. So I'm going to start off with a brief overview of the Xerces Society for anyone that may not be as familiar with us just to get us all on the same page with our work, then go into the different methods and details of those methods, um, case studies, and then lastly, resources. So the Xerces Society is a nonprofit organization based in Portland, Oregon, and we work to protect wildlife through the um, conservation of invertebrates and their habitats. We celebrated 50 years this past December, which was really exciting, um, founded in 1971 and started off as a butterfly conservation group working um, solely with butterflies and were named after the Xerces blue butterfly, which is pictured in the upper right. Um, it was the first butterfly in North America to go extinct um, due to land use changes or AKA habitat loss. So a bittersweet story. Um, in terms of the namesake. But after um, a few years and the organization growing and expertise coming in, we expanded our work um, out to include all invertebrates. And that includes everything from freshwater mussels to fireflies to bumblebees. And we are located all over the country. We do this really kind of unique, important work um, in a number of different ways. We have a few different teams within the Xerces Society, and I, along with the bulk of our staff, are working under the pollinator team. And we basically are out there trying to diversify the agricultural landscape. We also have an endangered species team that works to give um, voice to imperiled and often underrepresented species at the local, state, and federal level a pesticide team that keeps us up to date on all things um, pesticide related, pesticide research and literature. They do their own policy work um, at the state and local levels, as well as their own education outreach. And a few individuals that are working to provide the general public with a number of webinars, um, administrating our volunteer Xerces ambassadors program, and helping with our B City and B Campus um, initiatives. This is a map of our pollinator team. So as you can see, it's um, pretty well dispersed across the country, a few gaps in there. And we are divided into um, those of us that are working within the public sector, such as myself with the Natural Resource Conservation Service, whether that be at a state level, 
um, a two-state or multi-state level or a regional um, level. And basically, we are working one-on-one -on -one with landowners and farmers to implement, implement Habitat. We work to influence policy at the state level as well as the national level. And then the um, remainder of the pollinator team is working within the private sector with private companies, large growers, um, municipalities, departments of transportation, et cetera, to diversify those landscapes. So it's pretty um, obvious that you know, we do a lot of work, but we certainly don't do this work alone. It takes many hands, many partners, many individuals, volunteers, and just everyday people to um, kind of help everyone move forward in terms of invertebrate conservation and to expand our knowledge and help us get our messaging out there to the greater public. Okay, so now I'm gonna kind of deep dive into the topic for today. And I understand that the audience is um, more of a right of ways group or a roadside group. Um, so I decided to, this is one of the few roadside pictures that you'll see today. Um, but I threw this slide in here just to basically kind of lay a foundation that I think as restorationists, we, we understand the importance of diversity. I think, you know, we have knowledge of all the benefits that we can reap from having diversity within our seed mixes. But when it comes to organic site prep, I think it's a very critical tool um, in order to be sure that your project is going to be successful. So if you have the ability to um, put out a really robust native seed mix into um, a project using organic site prep, it's going to be very beneficial in the long run and just be one of the many tools available to you. So there are a few planning considerations when thinking about organic site prep. What is the current vegetation? Are you dealing with high weed pressure, uh, low weed pressure, perennial weeds, annual weeds? How big is the site? Are you working within square feet? Are you working within several acres? That's going to make a huge difference. And what equipment do you have available to you? And that can be everything from mechanical, such as implements or tractors, um, plant material, access to water, et cetera. And is there a concrete deadline for your project? Um, organic site prep really benefits from utilizing as much growing season as possible and potentially multiple growing seasons. So the longer that we can conduct the site prep, the better um, we are in the long run. And that can, that can be problematic sometimes. Um, and certainly within my job when I'm working with our farm bill programs that have pretty tight constraints. So at Xerces, we have a really lovely, um, pretty comprehensive guideline packet for organic site prep for wildflower establishment. And it does a really good job of outlining all the different techniques, the pros and cons, equipment that could be needed, when it makes sense, when it doesn't, et cetera. And um, all of these topics are included within that document, but for time's sake, I'm only gonna be focusing on solarization, smother cropping, tillage, and organic herbicides. And just a reminder again, that at Xerces, we're often working with uh, a variety of different types of habitats, um, predominantly within that rural landscape, but that or farm landscape, and that can be either um, rural or urban farms. Um, so we've done a little bit of both. So for solarization, essentially we are smothering the weeds and heating the soil in order to kill any existing um, weed seeds that are within, you know, a few inches of the topsoil. Uh, we want to lay this out for at least one growing season, um, but as we are just going to start off with cultivating a seed bed, kind of like we would for any other thing, or if you were planting a typical garden, uh, and we dig a trench around the entire perimeter of that space. We lay the plastic in the spring. We leave it there the whole season. We can then remove the plastic and plant in the fall, or you can leave the, uh, leave the plastic and plant in the spring. We really like to use six 
millimeter UV stabilized clear high tonneau plastic. And what's nice about working with farms is oftentimes they may have clear plastic um, available already or something that they've already used or a material that is um, easily accessible to them as purchasing new clear plastic can be quite expensive. Um, but we want to be sure that we're creating conditions that are inhabitable for plant growth. So zero airflow um, and we're making sure that we're repairing any rips or damage that um, may be caused you know, throughout the time that it's laid out, deer can be problematic. We also understand that it's not a silver bullet and it doesn't work best against every weed out there. And again, it's expensive if you're buying new and there are some plastic disposal issues that, you know, we're aware of um, that, you know, are a little bit unfavorable. It comes in variety of sizes from 64 feet all the way down to six feet, but we have found that the wider the area, the better just to reduce that weed edge effect on the planting. These are just a few photos of the trenching process. We've had farmers use um, various implements for trenching. more photos, um, going in, burying that plastic by hand, making sure everything's nice and tight, and also utilizing pieces of plastic, again, especially in a used plastic scenario, if you have scraps available or laying around, what have you, um, there are ways that you can still utilize that and piece it all together. This is not a site that we generally want to see. So we want to make sure that the edges are being mowed and the holes are being patched, trying to reduce that weed pressure as much as possible. And folks have had success with patching holes with greenhouse repair tape or clear gorilla tape. Farms have also experimented with reusing the plastic um, time and time again. So laying it out for one area, doing a seeding, prior to seeding, flipping that plastic over and reusing it. And now, you know, having a side-by-side -side, um, scenario of what, you know, a planting that's already establishing fairly well and one that's already or currently going through the establishment phase and still being mowed. And this was at a dairy farm up in Wisconsin. We've also tested solarization on a few different soil regimes. Um, this was a farm in central Minnesota that had really dry soils and basically was just an area that wasn't being utilized for anything else. And they had great success um, in terms of using solarization, but with dry soils, that's not really a shocking thing because likely we're gonna be dealing with fairly low weed pressure under those circumstances. Whereas in wetter scenarios, you're oftentimes dealing with um, a bit, you know, hardcore weeds, um, more problematic weeds that can be a bit of an issue. But thankfully, we do have a success story under this scenario. So another idle kind of unproductive area that was just being mowed year in and year out. Uh, the, the farmer wanted to convert that to something better, serve a better purpose. So they did solarization for one full growing season and did a spring seeding. And two years later, we come back and they have a really excellent, beautiful stand of um, kind of a wet meadow, wet prairie scenario. And I will say that this is a prime example of when diversity is something that's going to aid in the success of the planting. This was a very robust native seed mix and they also increased the number of seeds per, per square foot. So in the upper Midwest, um, we are often dealing with native plantings and seeds per square foot. In Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin, we're generally working with 40 or more seeds per square foot. And I don't know exactly um, what was used for this particular planting, but upwards of 60 seeds per square feet would not shock me. Um, Minnesota has really been pushing the envelope in terms of seeds per square foot. And we've also tried this off the farm, uh, just in a basically Kentucky bluegrass turf scenario. 
where they were able to use plastic and um, utilize other materials and be creative. Uh, did it necessarily need to do the trenching? It doesn't really make sense for such a small site. So they use bricks in order to prevent that airflow and really whatever material you can use to achieve that, um, you know, feel free to at least try it. Um, so this was another successful off the farm project. So I've already alluded to the fact that solarization isn't a silver bullet. Um, so in our experience within the upper Midwest, it has not worked very well for Canada thistle, yellow nut sedge, or purslane, uh, but for a number of common problematic weeds that we often face on a regular basis, we have seen success with. So it's encouraging to see success with smooth brome, reed canary grass, and Kentucky bluegrass um, especially. Next, I'll talk about smother cropping, which is just using a cover crop to outcompete weeds and um, seeding it at a pretty high density rate in order to get good establishment and create a really dense canopy that um, shades out other species and hopefully will establish before other things um, get to growing. We like to do at least one growing season with a smother crop. Um, two may be necessary under certain circumstances. Um, timing is essential. Uh, you want to be sure whatever cover crop you're choosing, you're planting it at the appropriate time so that it establishes well. Um, also having to realize that some species are cool season, some are warm season, some have shorter windows of growth. So you may have to for example, pluck, uh, plant buckwheat and then come back and plant a second crop of buckwheat because it may not um, achieve the full growing season window. Um, some other cropping may be an advantage to you all up north with a slightly shorter growing season than what we have down here. Um, so that may or may not work to your benefit. And with that timing, it also requires a lot of attention, a lot of eyes on the site and just checking in, making sure that things are growing, um, making sure that you're paying attention to seed set. Uh, again, a buckwheat example, we want to terminate that, which is photoed here, I should say. We want to terminate that buckwheat before um, it sets seed. Um, it is an annual species, so it's not a really, it's not a big deal per se, but it will reseed itself. Um, and choosing cover crop species that make sense for the site. Uh, they definitely differ in the soils they prefer, uh, the moisture they can handle, sun exposure, et cetera. But generally, termination would be through mowing, winter kill, and or cultivation. There are um, quite a few options for smother cropping. Buckwheat is definitely kind of our go-to one that we use most often. Um, but I'll show other examples of smother crops essentially you want to be choosing something that preferably is an annual so it's not going to be a long-term problematic weed that you're still dealing with post-establishment and something that germinates quickly establishes quickly and creates a dense canopy um, another resource that i use really often is the midwest cover crops field guide um, it really outlines a variety of different crop species um, you know the soil temperatures that they like the termination um, techniques, it's, you know, et cetera. And um, Ontario is included within the Midwest Cover Crop Council. So you can go to their website and uh, find more information if you're not familiar with them. Here we have not as many cool season smother crops available to us. Um, one that we use really often is oats and another potential candidate is winter wheat. Uh, winter wheat is a little more problematic in terms of its termination, where if we're doing this organically, we're likely going to have to use tillage, uh, which we may or may not really want to do because we don't want to disturb a site and potentially um, bring up the weeds that we are trying to prevent. So oats is an easy standby for us. Warm season cover crops include buckwheat, sorghum sedan, millet species, and more. And photoed here is buckwheat planted alongside uh, sorghum sudan. And what's nice about buckwheat, of course at Xerces, we like the pollinator value. Um, it attracts a lot of beneficial insects and pollinators while it's in bloom. 
So this is our first case study for smother cropping. Uh, we were dealing with a really nasty perennial Queen Anne's lace uh, weedy issue. In the summer of 2015, planted buckwheat, came back and um, I believe tilled the buckwheat under, which a few different farmers have done and had success with. And this was planted with seed as well as planting plugs. And two years later, having really great success. And another cool story about the site is that we found at-risk bumblebee species inhabiting this area um, post-restoration. So that's, that's always really awesome and a, a good feel good. Another project was um, basically using a combination. So utilizing that cool season crop followed by the warm season crop. The growing conditions originally were predominantly quack grass. Uh, this strip of area had been cover cropped a few times, but hadn't been put in production for any reason. So the weed pressure was relatively low. So they came in the spring, planted oats, later came back and planted their millet smother crop, and then later did a light drag and a broadcast seeding. Um, going into a wet scenario, so thinking about the soils a little bit more, Japanese millet and sorghum sudan grass are really good options for those difficult areas to farm that may not be really productive, that would be better as something else, and have some of those problematic weeds. Um, so again, this was a wetter site. And we originally did a 50-50 combination with Japanese millet and sorghum sudan grass. The following year, so two seasons of smother crops, did just a sorghum sudan grass smother that was eventually mowed and then burned off in the dormant season prior to seeding. Now these smother crops are really great in that they are gonna suppress weeds really well. Um, they establish well, uh, but they create a lot of biomass, which can be really tricky in terms of planting and needing to have that seed to soil contact. So it can be finicky and you may have to be a little creative on how you kind of um, remove that vegetation. If, you know, shallow, very shallow tillage could be an option. But again, you know, some people think that's a little dicey. Um, burning is an option. If neither of those are an option, you could potentially let that vegetation sit over the winter, decompose, come back and do um, a spring seeding or potentially, you know, rake and bale off um, that vegetation too. So we, we haven't quite figured out the best, best case scenario for that, but we are um, and have been experimenting with it. Then we have repeat cultivation, which is tillage. And we emphasize that we really want to use implements with shallow depth. We do not want to be doing any rigorous deep tillage. Um, this is something that needs to be repeated throughout the growing season. So again, the timing, the attention, being on site, seeing what's going on is going to be really critical. Generally, you're doing it every month or so. Um, we have seen variable results. It's kind of a finicky, um, finicky method, depending on the weather, where farmers have had not so great success because, you know, they were in a drought or it wasn't raining or they wish they would have started the tillage sooner in the springtime, gotten some of those spring rains to stimulate growth, had a few more passes and then continued on throughout the growing season. Um, so we just advocate that perhaps this is a better method when the weed pressure is fairly low. And of course, there's um, concerns about soil erosion if we're dealing with any, you know, steep topography or, um, you know, probably not a good idea and should stick with flat land for the most part. And I should mention that if it's possible, if you're in a drought scenario or you find yourself in that scenario, if there's a way to irrigate that area to stimulate growth, that may help you. Um, and there are, you know, kind of a lot of warnings when it comes to tillage, but that's not to say that it can't be successful because it surely can. Um, so we have had people have, you know, great success with tillage. 
And lastly, we have organic herbicides, which essentially is going to work the same as any other conventional herbicide in that uh, the goal is to weaken, preferably kill the weeds using non-selective and non-persistent herbicides are best. Uh, we're going to cultivate in early spring, create that seed bed, and do regular applications throughout the growing season. Um, and I think the height at which you spray or the, t the amount of times you spray might depend on whatever weeds, uh, whether that's grasses or broad leaves that you may be um, trying to manage. Avoiding additional tillage, we don't want to re um, encourage any other weed growth and then coming back and seeding in the fall. So some adaptive weed management. I mean, this, these things can be said regardless of you're using conventional site prep or organic site prep, but it is so important to tailor your approach to best target the weeds on site and to focus on those um, problematic, invasive, persistent perennial weeds, you know, your biggest problem child, so to speak. Um, and understanding that it may require multiple seasons or multiple methods using a combination of tillage and some other crops um, or tillage and an organic herbicide, um, burning with smother cropping, et cetera. Planting, you could definitely um, design your seed, seed mix in a way that is advantageous to you. So choosing aggressive species that you know will establish well, establish quickly, um, do well on their own, filling in as many niches as possible. So including all of the native plant functional groups that you can and considering um, plugs or container plants uh, if needed. So certainly when working with smaller sites, um, like a 10th of an acre or less, for example, plugs can be better in the sense that they have that competitive advantage of being established plants and not having to come up from seed. And then post seeding, we do our usual um, establishment mowings for at least one growing season, which is about three mowings a year down here and the following year doing perhaps an additional mowing um, or two. And then of course the ongoing treatment that takes place um, throughout the lifespan of the planting. So kind of wrapping things up and thinking about those considerations again, um, you know, again and again, time is significant to any and all site prep, but especially organic. The more time you can give yourself, the better. Choosing a method that you're comfortable with, as well as a method and or crop that makes sense for the site is critical. And then lastly, as I've said many times already, plant diversity, um, an important tool that uh, you could certainly use to your advantage. And I will also just say that we are continuing to learn all the time. Xerxes by no means has everything figured out. We still have many questions, um, but I just wanna give a quick shout out to all of our farmer partners that have really been instrumental in allowing us to learn what we know, um, to basically experiment alongside us and volunteer to, um, to take land out of production and, and try new things. Um, so it's, it's really rewarding and certainly something that we, um, we can't give enough praise to. So this is just one example of that. At Circe's, we have a plethora of information on our website, um, lots of other uh, organic pesticide, organic site prep materials that may be beneficial to you, as well as habitat management, um, pollinator conservation, et cetera. We do have a web page specifically for managing roadsides and rights of way for pollinators. I have the link here. I just realized I should hide that so you can actually see it. Um, yeah, so there's, it's, it's kind of its own home that hopefully will narrow down the publications that are specific to those needs. Um, but I will say that um, if anyone is looking for something in particular, please feel free to reach out to me, reach out to another Cersei staff member. Um, it may be easier for us to find it um, than you spending too much time on that. And we're, we're totally okay answering any and all questions. So with that, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Sarah. That was very, very thorough. <laughs> <laughs>
it's also a very pressing topic as we get asked that a lot. How can I do with this without pesticides or herbicides? Because, you know, they can be quite contentious. So, Absolutely. Yeah. So we'll jump over to questions. So uh, if we have any questions from our listeners, uh, please hop over to the Q&A. Uh, we do have one question there. And you can also uh, put your hand up. And if you want to ask your question in person to Sarah, we can do that as well. So we're waiting for that. I'll ask you Jamie's question. Have you ever experimented with native cover crops? We have. We um, have experimented with partridge pea um, specifically as a native cover crop. Um, other people have wondered if maybe Black Eyed Susan could serve the same purpose. Um, Primrose has been thrown around as a potential um, I know the Iowa Department of Natural Resources has thought about using Primrose and Black Eyed Susan, but with Cersei's, um, we, we've used Partridge Pea. Great. And a question from me. Have yeah. you guys ever uh, been able to control sites with parsnip or phragmites by using smothering or some of the other techniques? Oh boy. <laughs> yeah, those are too big in our area. That yes. <laughs> yes. Those are, those are huge. Um, I can't think of a specific uh, case study for either of those two um, plants or scenarios, but I know that, you know, we are also dealing, dealing with that. And I think that may possibly be because, you know, for the most part, we're working on farms. So many of these areas have been, cultivated and um, tilled and not been, I, you know, some of them are idle ground and, and some of them are coming out of production where the weed pressure is really low. Um, but I don't know of any other, you know, natural resource managers that have attempted that. Okay. But great question. Good to know. Okay, another question here from David. Do you, does Zersi have any folks that specialize in utility rights of way management? We sure do. Um, my supervisor, Jennifer Hopwood, who is based out of Omaha, Nebraska, she is our rights of way um, go-to person at Xerces. And um, we were hoping that she would present today, <laughs> <laughs> but I had to fill in for her. That's great. And she's got an email. I'm sure we can get in touch if we need yes. to. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one more question here from Nora. For a small site, we are planning to use newspaper cardboard and with mulch on top starting this spring and planning to remove in the fall to plant and possibly spread some seed. Do you agree it's best to remove the mulch for not too much nutrient? Um, I think I would, and I would also be careful about where you source your mulch and just, you know, be sure that you're not, you know, potentially introducing any weed seed with the mulch. Um, and yeah, but sheet mulching and using multiple layers of um, organic material uh, has been used before. Um, but that's that's just my my only one thing is just to make sure that you're not unintentionally introducing some other things there. Um, right. But certainly, so yep. make it worse for yourself. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, one other question for me: When we were talking about um, mowing heights, given that we're different season. Is there a certain height that you advise that you do the mowing at? Um, the mowing for, uh, for the cover crop. Yeah, so basically that's a really good question. Um, I would say if you can get, you know, buckwheat grows, gosh, I don't know, a couple, couple feet. It's not a very tall plant. Um, so you can mow that pretty short, pretty easily and essentially just knocking off the blooms and not allowing for seed set is good. Um, it doesn't it doesn't cause problems like sorghum sudan grass with the biomass. Um, and then the sorghum sudan, at least you know six inches if you can, eight inches. Um, yeah, it, it kind of depends on which how much biomass you have and what equipment you have available. And um, right. but the okay. more the better. Okay, that's great. Uh, it does not look like we have any other questions. Uh, just a comment. Thanks for sharing your experience, Sarah. Interesting topic. I would agree. And I think Victoria is going to join us for a poll here. 
Yes, hello. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was really wonderful. As Tracy mentioned, this is a question that we get a lot. So it's always best when we can bring in the experts to talk about it and have that experience under their belt. Uh, so uh, I know that this is something that a lot of people will, will appreciate. So um, yes, I'm going to uh, start off with a little quiz. Um, now I'm going to share my screen because this is a quiz that uses pictures. Bear with me for a moment. <laughs> Okay, so I think you can see my screen. I'm just going to move uh, to the next slide. Um, here we are, and I'll launch the poll on the side. So this, uh, oh, did it publish? There we go. So this poll is which of the following organic site, or, or sorry, which of the following are organic site preparation techniques? So this is a multiple choice answer. You can include more than one. All right, do you have any other responses? Oh, it's still going up. We have more people in the session than I expected. <laughs> it keeps going up and up. <laughs> All right. Let's see if I can show this on the stage. So it looks like most people indicated solarization, some other crops, and repeat cultivation. And maybe this was a little bit of a tricky question because certainly there, as uh, Sarah um, alluded to in her presentation, there are organic herbicides that uh, are available, um, but um, this uh, glyphosate is not one that we're, we're thinking about when we're thinking about organic restoration. So close that poll. Okay. So um, that brings us to the end of the, the formal component of um, our, our workshop today. So for some of you, we will be moving on to some regional sessions. Let's um, change my, my slide here. Um, so at uh, we'll be having a break at 1.45 p.m. for those of you who are registered for either our Eastern Ontario or our Southwestern Ontario communities of practice. For those of you who are not within those regions, um, this will be, like I mentioned, the end of the formal workshop. So I just want to take this opportunity to, to close um, and do a, a little bit of a summary. Now, um, it does not mean that you have to leave AirMeet at this moment, just because uh, this is the end of the formal component. You are free to go back into the exhibition hall if there was anything that you didn't get a chance to see. There are some tools that are listed there, such as a mowing map um, that's been created for um, the uh, the Southern and Eastern Ontario region. Um, there's also uh, a tool that we're looking at developing um, for a dashboard that you might be interested in looking more in. Um, and if you're just looking to uh, find out more information about some of the, the industry providers that are on there, I encourage you to look at that. Um, so we'll also just do one other poll here to take some time to think about um, what it is that you would like to see from CWF and our network in the future. Uh, so I'm going to publish this one here. So what uh, additional restoration information would you like most from CWF? So um, today, of course, Sarah filled a, a knowledge gap that we had on organic restoration. Um, but what are some other things that you would be interested in learning more about in the future? So whether this is um, in a form of a presentation, a panel, maybe it's an in-person event uh, or tools or resources. Um, we'd love to learn a little bit more about what it is that you would like to, to know more of. And I'll keep that open and I'll go on to my next slide while you're responding. 
So I'll just hide it from this stage for a moment, but it's still on that right-hand side for you. Okay, so I thought I'd do a little bit uh, of a summary of the day. So this morning we started out with our exhibition hall. As I already mentioned, we had some pretty cool tools on there. You're also able to interact with the exhibitors to learn more about what, uh, what is available to support your restoration efforts. We had, oh, is it going? We had a, a keynote speaker in our welcome session from Jubilee from Environment Hamilton, who was really focusing on the collaborative efforts that allow restoration to take place within a community. So those um, comprehensive and collaborative aspects we had our lightning talks where you were able to learn about some projects that were taking place in Canada and projects in general that are supporting restoration. So it's very much a, a peer led session. We brought things back to the foundation where we heard from Jeff and Carolyn about uh, ecological services and pollinator biology. And then we had that panel with Keith and Pete to learn how to communicate restoration with uh, adjacent landowners, specifically farmers. And of course, just now we heard from Sarah on uh, organic site preparation. So all these parts, they, compo uh, they include components of increasing um, the, the knowledge and techniques that you can use to put towards restoration. They include um, some supports and opportunities to learn from your peers who are going through the same things as you um, and all at just different stages. And next, I would encourage you to take some time to communicate the information that you've learned with others. So when you leave today, I know a lot of us are still working at home, but um, in your next meetings with your colleagues who you work with, maybe they're um, on your team or maybe they're in another department that you think would um, uh, benefit from learning, I highly encourage you to take what you have learned and share it with them um, so we can really uh, move forward together in improving pollinator habitat restoration um, and the projects that we're doing in the future. So just one final thing, I would like us all just to take a moment in the chat storm. So begin thinking about what insights you're leaving with. Don't put them in the chat just yet. I'll tell you when to go, but just think about a few things. I know it, it takes a little while, but what, what are the key insights that you're going to be leaving this workshop with today? So just take a moment, I'll give a few more seconds. You can start typing them, but maybe just don't respond yet. <laughs> okay, just another few seconds. So what is it, uh, if, you, if you don't remember anything from the session today, you leave and you can't remember anything, but what is the one thing that you'll think you'll remember? <laughs> okay, so on your marks, Get that, go, and you can put your answers in the chat. I'm not seeing anything come in yet. All right, okay, they're all coming in now. <laughs> uh, so we have um, flower flies are the best for pollinators. Um, organic site prep isn't as time consuming as I originally thought. So dispelling some potential um, misunderstandings, that's great. Someone just wrote swamp milkweed. So something to maybe look into in the future. Um, that there are many resources available uh, to carry up projects, and that's certainly the case. And we recommend that if you uh, join our, our Rights of Way as Habitat Working Group, um, that you'll be able to get access to additional resources. Um, and that there's multiple benefits of using native variety of seed mixes. So there's things that are focused on, on technical components and also support for restoration. So that's really great. And I hope that when we um, were thinking this morning about what you wanted to get out of the session, that um, those will, will hopefully line up a little bit. 
Uh, so just some upcoming activities that you can expect in the future. So whether emails or if you join our new LinkedIn group, we'll put some messages on there. Uh, first up is for those that are in Southwestern Ontario, we're hosting an exclusive virtual training for roadside managers. That's taking place tomorrow. Um, so if you're located within that area, but you're not registered and you would like to attend, please send us a message or an email, um, that email just on the screen there. And we'll make sure that you're registered for that. This is with Stephanie Jobs, uh, who's from the Illinois Department of Transportation. And uh, she has been real champion and has transformed um, restoration that uh, takes place um, uh, within the, the state. Um, you can stay tuned in the spring for our upcoming webinar series. We'll be hosting at least three webinars um, on topics that are related to restoration. In the spring of 2022, we will also um, be continuing with our uh, communities of practice meeting. So um, this afternoon, we'll be hosting the first for Southwestern Ontario. We have not held one yet, so that's very exciting. And we'll be continuing on with Eastern Ontario. If you're interested in joining these networks as well, you can just go to the exhibition hall and um, click the respective groups and click I'm interested. And also in the summer of 2022, we're going to be hosting an Eastern Ontario training for roadside managers. This is to be built upon a training that took place last year where we were able to meet in person in Lanark County and um, have a, a guided roadside tour on uh, the various treatments and, and areas on the roadside um, that have been restored. So I encourage you to sign up for our network so you can be sure to hear about these events. Um, and I'm also just going to add a link in a moment, let's see here, for our LinkedIn group. Uh, there was an announcement about it, I'm not sure if you got to see it, but I just want to make sure that you have that available to you. Uh, let's see here. Put that in the chat, you can click if you use LinkedIn. Um, and so this space for this group, it's a, a group um, where you'll be able to ask questions, whether it's to uh, our team, but also to other rights of way managers about anything involving restoration, have just in general the latest news about restoration, and also uh, tools and resources and notifications about our events as well. So if you are someone who uses LinkedIn quite frequently, this will be really great because you'll get all those notifications uh, right off the bat and you'll always be up to date. And uh, that brings us to our close. I just wanna take a moment to thank all of you for joining us here today. It's been really wonderful to have you. And I'm just so uh, surprised by how far people have come. Um, and I, I mean that uh, in a virtual way, I know we're all coming from across Canada in the US, but it's really incredible we have this opportunity to actually get together um, and interact with each other and learn from each other. Um, so I'm really grateful for that today. Uh, and I also just want to um, say thank you for our, our Funder Ontario Trillium Foundation for helping make this, um, this workshop possible today. So for those of you who are in the regional sessions, I'll see you shortly, but otherwise I, I hope to see you all soon and stay tuned for um, a, an email that we'll send out with uh, the recordings and some other resources from today. Bye everyone.